Good day everyone and welcome to today's Credit Scorecard Development Webinar. I would like to introduce today's speaker. I am joined by my colleague Dr. Mamdu Rifat, ANGOS VP of Research and Development and Chief Data Scientist. Mamdu is an expert and published author with over 20 years of experience in predictive analytics and data mining. He has led numerous projects in the area of marketing, CRM, and credit risk for Fortune 500 companies in North America and Europe. Welcome to the first webinar in this series dedicated to credit risk scorecards. In this first webinar, we will have an overview of why we need scorecards, their formats, and their advantages over general probabilistic models. We will then discuss the different types of scorecards as they map the different aspects of the risk management process. After that, we will review the process used to develop what is known as the standard scorecard. Then we will discuss how we deploy scorecards in the form of strategies and how we monitor the performance of these scorecards using specific reports. Finally, we will briefly explore the subjects of the remaining webinars in this series. At this point, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Mamdu to talk about credit scorecards, challenges, and opportunities. Credit scoring is a core business function to almost all organizations providing credit as a service to their customers. Uh, examples of such products, credit cards, loan, mortgages uh, are typical examples. Also, other organizations uh, offering products on credit, such as utilities, online merchants, telecommunications are also uh, using extensively credit scoring to screen customers. Um, credit score cards in general is just a, a neutral objective way to assess the creditworthiness of customers and applications. Now we look at uh, the typical stages in the lifetime of any credit product and the corresponding scorecards or models that we build to calculate the likelihood of default or the creditworthiness of the customers at this stage. First, at the origination level, that's where uh, new customers are applying for the product. In this case, we build the application scorecard, and the purpose of it is to calculate the likelihood that if I accept these customers and grant them uh, the credit, will they actually meet their obligations or not? So whether they will go delinquent at one point in the future or not. Once I accepted certain customers, then what I want to do is to monitor their behavior. So while, for example, customers are using credit cards or paying back the loans or mortgages, I want to monitor their behavior and make sure that they will continue meeting their uh, obligations. So I'm calculating the likelihood that they will go delinquent uh, at one point in the future at a certain uh, in a certain time window. So I want to know, for example, whether this customer is likely to go delinquent uh, the next three months or next six months and so on. Finally, some of these customers will actually go bad, will go into collections, will stop meeting their obligations and will be labeled as in collections and uh, they have stopped payment completely. So what will happen then? At, at that stage, those customers that go into collections, I want to build a scorecard to see what is the likelihood that I will be able to recover from that situation, either by self-cure, that means they're, they are going to recover by themselves, they are just lazy payers, or uh, I have to actually do some collections effort by calling them and collecting this money from them. So I want to calculate the likelihood that they will actually pay back or not. Scorecards are usually presented in a tabular form, as this table here. This is known as a standard scorecard format. And the standard scorecard format uh, assigns uh, base points to start with. So every account uh, gets, for example, in this case, 220 points. And then, depending on the values of specific characteristics or predictors or variables, I'm going to assign certain points. And each one of these characteristics or variables is divided or segmented into ranges or values. For example, annual income, if it's less than 25K, 25K to 50K, 50K and above, and so on. This format is known as the standard scorecard format. And in that format, the total number of points that each account or each customer would get is just simply the summation of the points assigned to that specific account. Now, 
there are several characteristics that are attractive uh, for this uh, standard scorecard format. The first one is that instead of dealing with probabilities, which is the outcome of most predictive models, um, I deal with points. And in this case, I can take these points and interpret them as, for example, high points mean better customers than lower points. Now, also, uh, it allows me, uh, through the representation of points, it allows me to explain these points in easy, simple terms because then the clients can see why did I assign them 55 points for the income instead of 75 points. Another uh, advantage also is that the end users, the customers themselves who get the, the, the scores, uh, get scored, they can see how can I improve my score. For example, if again I look at the variable income, if I, my income, for example, is higher than 50K, then to, if I'm assigned only 75 points, so maybe all I need to do is just submit documents showing that my income is more than 50K, and in this way, I gain extra 15 points. Finally, uh, for IT, from the IT point of view and for the deployment of the scorecards, uh, because a simple uh, format of the standard scorecard, just simple additive table, a set of if-then-else rules and assigning points, deploying this scorecard becomes very easy and straightforward in most uh, IT systems. Now we comes to uh, the definition of what is default. When we say the customer will go delinquent or go default, what does it mean? It means that the customer or the account, there is no payment or non-payment over a certain number of days. So this is the typical way of defining it. For example, if I say the customer stopped paying for a total of 30 days, 90 days or more, a specific number of days, this is what we call default. So typically 60 days delinquency or 90 days delinquency. Once the customer exceeds this value, let's say 90 days uh, delinquency, then it's classified as this account is bad. If it's below that, then it's good. It's zero, and this customer is up to date and meeting their obligations. As this uh, simple line chart there, for example, showing anyone above 90 days is bad, anyone on uh, zero days past due is exactly good. Now, there are situations where we have some customers or some accounts have a certain number of uh, uh, days past due, but they haven't really crossed the, the threshold of being bad yet. So, for example, 75 days past due. Is that good or bad? So, in this case, we have an intermediate uh, uh, state which it's not really defined. It's not really good or bad. It's not good because it's less than good, uh, than good but it hasn't reached the bad level yet. And that way we can even, uh, we, we are forced to define three categories, good, intermediate, and bad. We now go into the uh, stage where we can define the steps of developing a scorecard. The process of developing a scorecard is simply a set of logical steps. First, we collect the data, prepare it and clean it up, and then we select certain uh, variables or attributes that will be used in the model. But before we start building the model, we do what is known as course classing and weight of evidence transformations, and then we build the model, validate it and test it, and then uh, scale the scorecard and deploy it. We will go into each one of these steps uh, in the following slides and in more details in the future session. So the first step is to collect the data. There are two types of data or two sources of data that are used in building scorecards. Sources of data from inside the organization, internal data sets, and sources from the outside. From inside the organization, we always have the application data. So we have the, the data that we're provided by the customer at the point of application, like age, like uh, income, uh, number of years of residency, how did this uh, sale happen, the sales channel, and so on. And also we have, in the case, once the customer has been accepted, for example, a credit card, then we have all the balances, we have all number of usages, we have the uh, uh, payment history, and so on. We have a lot of variables over time that represents the behavior of the customer in using uh, the credit product. External data sources can be classified into two types of data 
uh, sources. One of them, a very important one, is bureau scores. These are average scores provided by vendors of um, credit score data like Fair Isaac, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, they all provide average scores that help me identify the risk level assigned with that customer historically uh, as a part of a group. On the other hand, there is also demographics database bases such as Axiom and Mosaic that gives me the demographics profile of the customer. Because these databases contain very large number of variables and packages, they are sold in groups and packages and so on, uh, I may end up with uh, literally a very large number of variables in the data, especially the behavior, the scores, the demographics databases are usually very large data sets. And then I end up with uh, possibly thousands and thousands of variables. Then comes the task of merging all these files, appending them, uh, aggregating the files and the values, and this becomes a major task because, in general, all the steps of data preparation, uh, which sometimes cannot be completely separated from the task of data, identifying the data sources and collecting the data, because we collect some data, prepare it, and then we discover we need more data, we go and collect more data, and so on. So, uh, the data preparation procedures is actually uh, the most uh, time-consuming step in the whole scorecard development process, even in any uh, modeling process. Typically, it consumes between 50% and up to 80% of the time in some cases. So, we will be busy doing things like merging and appending and aggregating files, finding and treating outliers. Of course, we have to define what is an outlier. Later on in this series, we will go into more details in how to define outliers and how we treat them. Uh, missing values. I marked missing values here with two stars because actually if we look at any business database, we find that the most common value or most frequent value is missing. So missing values is a big thing and I have to identify and uh, come up with a systematic way of treating missing values. Where do they come from? What is their source? Why did they come in this uh, format? And what do I do with them? Do I replace them? Do I keep them as is? Do I treat them as, do I do some kind of imputation on them? What do I do with missing values is a very important question. Again, we will go into more details and the options and the procedures of doing that in, in the uh, future parts of this series. Uh, sometimes also the fields that I find in the database are not sufficient to build a strong scorecard. So maybe I need to calculate fields, averages, uh, aggregations, uh, I do summaries and so on. Um, then we will have to decide on three windows, three time windows that uh, specify the data. The first time window is the modeling window, the data on which I'm going to build the model. For example, I can say the data is going to be uh, covering the range of behavior from January 1st, 2012 to end of that uh, year. But what is the prediction window? When do I, uh, how long will I, when I say default will happen, 90 day default will happen, when will that happen? Will it happen in a month, in two, in three, in five, what? And then when I also want to test the model, I have to test it on another time window uh, that is outside that modeling window because I have to see whether uh, the changes in the population during that time actually affected the scorecard or not. So we have to define three windows, the modeling window, the prediction window, and the out of time window. Having gone through the stages of uh, data, data collection and data preparation, I typically end up with really large number of variables, sometimes thousands. And um, we will not actually try to use all these variables in a model, but we will have to filter these variables because of practical reasons. And so we have to select which of these variables promise to be more predictive and then out of that reduced set, I start trying to build a model to select the finer set of variables that will enter the actual scorecard. So to do that, we have to apply a filter where we use some measures of predictive power to select the best variables that I use in the model. Typical uh, predictive power measures use chi-square, information value, um, uh, 
uh, Gini index, entropy variance, and so on. So there are a large number of predictive uh, power measures that can be used to automatically or uh, through an algorithm reduce the variables into a 